Welcome to John Gates Games. This is my impressions vlog covering all of the new games that I played throughout May 2019, and as you can see, that is six different games. Now, the depth and complexity of these games ranges pretty wildly, and I'm going to talk about them in alphabetical order. Now, before I jump into all that, I would like to ask that if you enjoyed this video, you please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Also, if you would like to directly support this channel and the creation of future videos just like this one, then please go to jongetsgames.com support. You will find a bunch of ways you can can do that there and there are a few pretty cool perks including voting on a couple of the videos that I filmed each month. All right, without further ado, let's jump into the list. Now the first game on here is 1867 The Railways of Canada. Now if you are familiar with my channel, you might notice that I have never talked about an 18xx game before. Now if you've never heard either of those terms, I will briefly say that this is an entire genre of games. They're called 18xx because the two X's stand for various dates. Um, there are a ton of different uh, 18xx games. The one I played was 1867, but there's also 1846, there's an 1861, which is what 18 67 is actually based off of. There's an 1817, an 18... I don't know, I think there's over 100 of these. I could be wrong. There's probably one for every single date in the 1800s. Now, uh, when it comes to these games, uh, to the best of my knowledge, they all are train-style uh, route-building games with stock holding in a variety of different companies. Now, each one of these games seems to have a similar backbone of mechanics, but then every one has a variety of tweaks and subtle shifts, um, some not so subtle from uh, my understanding anyway, and I'm going to tell you right now that I am super not an expert when it comes to these style of games. I've been hearing about 18xx games for, well, the 10 or so years that I've been uh, super obsessed with board games, and for most of that time, I have not been particularly interested in trying them because I always heard that they were crazy long, like, seven to ten hours. Um, I heard that they were really big into stocks uh, where you buy, uh, you try to buy low and sell high, and you can buy stocks in different companies and wrest control away from different people, which... I'm okay with as a mechanic, I'm just awful at. I played a bunch of Imperial 2030 back in like 2011 and 2012, and I don't think I ever even came close to winning that game. So these are various reasons why I've never really been interested in uh, following uh, up with these 18xx games. But then an opportunity presented itself a few months ago. Uh, there's this guy named Josh Starr, and he is starting a new board game publishing company called Grand Trunk Games. And the idea that he is uh, putting into this company is that he wants to reprint 18 XX games, but with better rules and better components. Now, if you are familiar at all with this style of game, you'll probably know that they look like prototypes, and they don't even look like good prototypes. They just have, you know, very bland-looking artwork that's, that works very well, and the rule books are atrocious. Now, I'm going to tell you that from my personal experience, because uh, when Josh reached out to me, um, we uh, talked about potentially uh, getting together and uh, playing one of these games, and he wanted to play 1867, because this is one of the games he's reprinting. I said, cool, well, I'm going to go read the rules. So I uh, downloaded the rules from Board Game Geek, and I made it like maybe two or three pages in before I realized I had no clue what was going on, because the basis of the rules for this game um, essentially assumed that you know how most 18xx games work. The rules told you how 1867 is different from other 18xx games. And since I didn't know how to play those other games, that I was totally lost. There isn't a single graphic in the entire rulebook. It's all text with um, tons of minutiae, little uh, details and whatnot. It just made no sense to me. And I think this is a big barrier to entry that Josh is trying to overcome with his uh, new company. Um, he's going to try to make a rulebook that anyone can sit down, read, and understand, even if they have zero experience with 18xx. Anyway, this has been a really long preamble for uh, this uh, play that I had, so I ended up uh, getting together with Josh as well as Amby and Toby. Uh, Amby is uh, one of the people, uh, part of the Board Game Blitz podcast, and uh, her and her husband Toby are super into 18xx games. So we met up at their house, and they uh, graciously taught me everything from the very uh, bare bones of 18xx games. And I will tell you right now that Amby uh, is part of the Dice Tower, and she put out a series about 18xx games for people who don't know anything about them. And on the uh, train ride over to her house, it was like a 40-minute long train ride, I watched her primer on 18xx games. She has several different videos. That, um, all of them are less than 10 minutes, and they give you, I think they are anyway, and they give you a rough idea of how these games work, um, where you should start if you don't know about them, and all that. I really highly recommend them because I watched them before I came into this play. Now, when it comes to the game itself, I am not going to go into all of the minutiae because... 
Well, it takes a while to teach these games, and I don't want to talk about the back uh, history of it too much, but I will say that it seems like most 18xx games have you out on a map that's essentially devoid of anything on it except for some spots with cities, and you are going to control companies, whether they are private or public, depending on the game, and as you go through the game, you will purchase trains, and you will also put out these little tokens onto the board to um, occupy different cities, and then you will build maps, little, little routes of train routes from one city to the next, and and at the beginning of the game, you start off with really simple routes, and then as you get to various stages of the game, you will be able to bring in more and more complicated routes. You essentially upgrade the routes so they maintain their previous connections, and then you can add more connections. Now, the way that 1867 progressed through the, um, these uh, phases is the way I think most 18xx games do, whereas certain types of trains get used up, then you will move on to the next era. There's essentially crappy trains at the beginning of the game and amazing trains at the end, and when you um, run out of certain amount of those as you go from awful to great, you enter new phases where new mechanics come into play. Um, now, that means as you get to certain points, your old trains will rust out and essentially become destroyed. And this is one big, uh, one big way that uh, players can uh, kind of interact with each other because you can really force the era to change by spending a bunch of money to buy some trains to finish out a stack in order to rust a bunch of your opponent's trains before they were able to run them. Now, when it comes to running, um, I when, when I first looked at a bunch of images of 18xx games, I kind of assumed that they were all about, like, pick up and deliver. I just assumed that because, you know, train games, you have trains, they run from here, they go to there, obviously they must take things from here and move them over there. And I was actually surprised at how simple the uh, run, uh, the route running aspect of the game was. Um, you aren't picking things up and dropping them off. You are simply looking at the spots you have on the board, you're looking at how good your trains are, and then you're counting how many um, different cities you can go away. Like if you have a, a level four train, you can go to four different cities. And you, have, you obviously have to uh, follow these paths and the cities give you money and the number of cities you go to, you just add up the money symbols that are on those cities and that's the amount of money you get. This game is just about getting money. Um, now in 1867, there are these private companies and these public companies. And I don't believe all 18xx games has this this distinction. Um, in this game in particular, there is an auction at the very beginning of the game as part of setup to um, have people get these private companies. Now, with these private companies, you own half of it, which means whenever that private company makes money, you get half of it personally, like in your own little piggy bank, and then half goes on to the company. Now, the company is the, the entity that actually spends money on buying new tra trains and all that kind of stuff. And at the end of the game, when everything is all said and done, the person with the most private money wins. So this game is all about trying to um, uh, put money into these companies so that they can invest in their future and flourish, but then also pull money out of them. Now, at a certain point in 1867, you can turn your private companies into public companies, or you can merge your private companies into public companies. And I'm not going to talk about the details of that at all. But I will say that once a company becomes public, then everybody else can buy stocks in it. Now, in this game, I was able to create two of these public companies. I think I was the only player who did. Um, everybody else had one, or I think one player might have had zero. No, I think everybody had one by the very end of the game. Uh, one person got one like on the second to last round. Now, I thought I was in an amazing uh, position. I was like, man, I'm doing really well for my first 18xx game. All of these people I'm playing with are super experts. They were, of course, giving me tons of advice. Like, um, the fact that I was doing well was, you know, I think partially luck and partially because I'd be like, do you think I should do this or this? And they're like, oh, I think doing the first thing is probably better because this, 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 and this. And I'm like, oh, yeah. I didn't see that. So I would do that instead. So I was heavily guided. And about two thirds way through the game, I was like, am I going to win this game? Like, this is crazy. Like I'm doing so well. I got these two awesome public companies. I have stock in these companies. But then something interesting happened, specifically right around the time I got that second public company where I was feeling really good about myself. Well, I bought a couple of stocks in the company. When you make a public company, you get some kind of for free. And then what happened is I ran out of money, personal money, to buy more stocks. And before I was able to get more personal money in the next round by running trains and getting money, all of my opponents bought pretty much the rest of the stocks in my second public company. What that meant is I had like, I think three stocks in that company. One of my opponents also had three. And then my other two opponents had like two and two. I think that maths out. There are 10 stocks, something like that. Either way, um, just so you know that I essentially created the company, you get two stocks right away. I bought an extra one thinking I was okay. And then before I had extra money in the next round, there were no more stocks left. And what that meant is, I was a lot less enthusiastic about making that company work well because I had three stocks, my opponent had three stocks. Uh, fortunately, because um, a tie is only broken for control of a company when somebody has more stocks, I didn't lose control of that company. But 
all of the money I made, I gave an equal amount of money and points to that opponent. So that wasn't great. And then my other opponents, well, they had like one less stock than me. So they made just a little bit less than me. So suddenly I have this awesome public company that I spent tons of turns putting together, but then I made it public at the wrong time when I did not have enough money to get a large amount of, of the stocks. And I think that if I played the game slightly differently, and I'm not going to talk about the details of it, I made one crucial mistake buying a stock from an opponent that I really shouldn't have in a company that ended up going nowhere and actually went bust. If I had that money from the stock that I spent there, I could have gotten a much better position. And I think I might have actually won. Now, I've talked about this game a lot already, and I will say that I had a really fun time with it. I wasn't really expecting to. I was hoping I was going to not have a bad time. Uh, you know, I in general, I don't like stock in games because, again, people can wrest control away from you. And I will say that uh, from my discussion with Josh, Amby, and Toby, that 1867 is a game where that happens very rarely. And I'm not really sure why, so I can't really go into the specifics of it. But this is a game really where when you create a company, you're pretty much going to own that company for the entire game. It is true, I almost lost control of one of my public companies, but that's because I was playing very poorly. Um, there was really no um, hostile takeovers or anything, and it sounds like in many other 18xx games, that is a thing that can happen, where you have this company, you think it's your baby, you're investing in it, and then suddenly people just buy it away from you, and you lose it because they take more stock for, um, than uh, in that company than you have. So um, right from the get-go, 1867 was better for me personally because, again, I am bad at controlling companies that can be ripped away from me, and I'm just really, uh, that doesn't really play to my uh, uh, strengths. Now, what it means is this game was really more about the infrastructure building, the route building, as well as the, uh, you know, getting your trains going, and I was pretty good at that, and I built a really solid route. Um, in general, it seemed like my opponents didn't really get in my way. Two of the opponents were just slugging it back and forth with their routes um, right from the very beginning of the game, and one of them came out ahead and the other one came out very much not ahead. And when the dust settled at the very end of the game, I came in second. Now, I'm pretty sure, again, the reason I came in second is not because I am an 18xx savant. Um, it's because I got tons of advice throughout this entire game. And I really appreciate that advice because it allowed me to feel competent. Like, it wasn't, I wasn't dead last um, and being, you know, uh, feeling like all my decisions were poor. I feel like a lot of the decisions I made were good and mine, but many of them were heavily motivated by these experts around the table. Now, I will say... Uh, uh, well, let's talk about the play length of the game. Um, I forget the uh, explicit uh, amount of time it took. I think our four-player game was at about four and a half hours, maybe closer to four. So it was not an extreme amount of time. Now, it sounds like the amount of time that 18xx games take uh, varies uh, to a tremendous amount. Uh, some of them are like 12 hours long or 15 hours long, and some of them can be even shorter than the one we played. But I do want to say that we didn't technically play through the entire game. And that's because we got to a point where essentially the game state was static in the middle of the board. There was no more optimizing that any of us could do with the new routes on the board. Um, all of the stocks were bought. And so, uh, and people were not really able to buy more trains to make anything make sense. Um, and we had gotten to the point where the end game trigger had been effectively triggered or was guaranteed to be triggered. We could kind of math it out. And what that meant is they, um, everyone around the table said, okay, now it's time for us to go to paper. And what that meant is they essentially simulated the last one or two overall rounds of the game, figuring out how much money everyone was going to get based off of their optimum routes that we had done in previous rounds. And then they added that all up to the amount of money that we had. And that was our end score. Now, uh, they told me that this is just kind of a trick that 18xx players um, uh, play when they get to the point where there are no more decisions, which apparently is a thing that can happen often in these games, then you just stop playing and you simulate the last couple rounds and then see where everybody is at. Now, that probably saved us at least an hour's worth of play where no real decisions would have ma been made. We just would have gone through all these procedural little steps. Whereas since I was playing with experts, they knew all of the tricks to quickly calculate all of these things on a piece of paper. Now, the scores were bonkers at the end. I came in second with a score of around 8,200. Uh, the first place player came in with like 8,800 or so, and then there was like a 6,000 and a 5,000, I think. And I've never, I think, ever scored that many points in any board game before. I mean, that might be more points than I've scored in all the board games I've played for the last couple of years, uh, which is just a little bit silly. And apparently that is the way these things often are in 18xx games. Uh, the scores are just humongously huge. And, you know, they said that I was relatively close to winning the game, being only 600 or so points behind the first place player. So at this point, I have talked a lot about this. I think I should probably wrap it up. Uh, I will end this by saying that I had an enjoyable time. 
it was probably the ideal circumstance for me to learn an 18xx game because I had an entire day blocked off for it. I was sitting with three experts who were um, very motivated to teach me how to play and uh, kind of guide me as I was working through things. And um, yeah, I, I have found that I enjoy route building more and more as time goes on as well. So the fact that I played 1867, which was very route building oriented, and very infrastructure oriented, and not about cutthroat ripping companies away from each other oriented, um, kind of played to my strengths as well. Also, there was only auctions at the beginning of the game. Um, once you get past the setup, there were no more auctions. So um, I'm not usually crazy about auctions. Either way, it seems like there is an 18xx game out there for probably every type of gamer uh, based off of the conversation that I had with Ambi, Toby, and Josh. And um, I think that's pretty cool. Now, one reason I've really shied away from them is because I thought they were all super cutthroat stock trading games that were crazy long. And it sounds like this is actually kind of a, like a frozen yogurt a store where you walk in and it's all frozen yogurt, but there are so many different varieties and you can kind of like mix and match based off of the incredible variety of different tweaks and different types of things with the mechanics of these games. So um, if this has made you at all interested in 18xx games, then I highly advise you uh, watch Ambi's uh, kind of primer videos that are posted up on the Dice Tower YouTube channel. I think they were super informative and they will go into uh, better depth about a lot of the things that I've said. And at this point, I should probably wrap this one up. Now let's move into the second new game I played this month and that was Blue Lagoon, and this is a much quicker game than the previous one I talked about. Uh, this is one of the newer games from Dr. Reiner Knizia, who has designed hundreds of games, and I was, uh, I've was i been actually kind of interested in playing this game for a couple months now. Um, it is a relatively lightweight game of uh, kind of abstract route building and control on a map with a bunch of islands and a bunch of water between those islands. Now, uh, I've heard about this for a couple months. I've seen some videos. In fact, um, at my other job where I do event lighting, I was chatting with a friend you know, everyone at that job knows I'm crazy about board games and that I'm, you know, making YouTube videos professionally for it. So whenever they bump into a new board game, they tell me about it because they're like, hey, I played a new board game last night. I'm like, ooh, what was it? And uh, this happened to me a couple months ago with a, a coworker of mine said, I played this game about lagoons and I don't know, we put like little huts and stuff down and I was like, is that Blue Lagoon? I've heard about that game. And he said, yeah. And he said that he really enjoyed it. He has not played that many games, but he was over at his girlfriend's family's place and they introduced it to him and they played it several times. Um, or maybe it was his girlfriend's friend's place. Either way, the details don't matter. Um, but it was, you know, recommendation from a friend of mine who does not play games that much. So uh, a couple days ago, I was at Victory Point Cafe in Berkeley, and we kind of had a lull in the amount of, in the games that we were playing. And I knew that they had it on the shelf. So I went over and pulled it out and I was like, I would really like to play this. They have it here. And I've been just curious. Now, in terms of what you're doing in this game, it is super duper simple. On your turn, all you do is you place a token down out onto the board. These tokens have two different sides. There is a hut side and there is a canoe side. And this game plays over two different, I guess, arcs. Um, you will play essentially two games of this back to back with the tiniest of rules differences between the two. Now, in both of these games, you are putting this token down, and if it goes onto water, you put the canoe side up, and if you put it onto the land, it goes the uh, kind of tent side up, and when you are uh, taking your turn, you can only ever put your token down next to a previously placed token of yours. Now, in the first of the two games that you play, there is a subtle change where you can always put a canoe down into any of the water spaces anywhere out on the board, so you always have to essentially um, uh, sail up to an island, and then from that canoe that you put down, you can then start building out onto land. Now, one thing you could do in the first game is instead of putting a token down for your tent, you could put this wooden tent token down, which is much uh, larger, and you have, I think, five of these in the four-player game we played. And the way this works is it, it functions just like the rest of these tokens, and you're going to try to scatter these out on the to the different islands. Now, once everybody has placed all of their tokens, or once all of these little resource tokens have been picked up on the map, you then end the first game and you score a bunch of stuff. You're going to get points for the number of islands you have presence on. If you have seven, if you're on seven or eight, which is the total number of islands, you're going to get a bunch of points for your longest contiguous set of connected tiles uh, based off the number of islands they're on. You're going to get a bunch of points for set collection for the various tokens that there are. And then once you finish that, you clear off the entire board, except for those large wooden huts that are there. At this point, you go into the second game of Blue Lagoon. The first, um, you know, half take about, I don't know, 30 minutes or so. And in the second game, um, you have slightly different rules where you can no longer place a canoe anywhere, you always have to place next to something that you already have out on the board. Now, fortunately for you, you have seeded the board in the first phase by putting these large 
huts down onto the board. So in that second half of the game, it's a lot tighter. You are not allowed to kind of go off to the far corners to place um, your influence down in various spots. You are really locked in. And this is effectively a super competitive abstract style game. We played a four player game of it and, you know, it seems simple. Just put a hexagon tile down every single one of your turns and that's it. But it really became a game where you are just looking out, trying to figure out, can I get to this resource before my opponent does? Well, no, they can't get there before I do, so I'm going to do other things. Well, suddenly they faint in, and you're like, okay, now I need to go over there because I'm going to take this before. They have an option to take it. So it's this game of constantly trying to figure out where your uh, risks are and where they aren't. So if you look out and you say, well, right now nobody's threatening any of the things that I'm kind of posturing to take, well, then you should go and threaten somebody else's thing that they're posturing to take so that they, they have to uh, kind of play defensive to take the thing that they're posturing to grab instead of affecting all the things that you have. And overall, uh, we played this four-player game. It probably took about an hour, and I really enjoyed it. Um, I am finding, as I um, get deeper and deeper into board games, you know, a decade on, that I'm really enjoying route-building style games a lot more, and that is what this is. You know, you're trying to connect all of these different things together because you have to build off of your previous tokens, and you get a lot of points for connecting the various islands. Now, in this game, I came, I think, last, but it was really quite close. The scores were, like, uh, between six, I think, or so. It was, like, 74 to 80 or something like that. And honestly, I kind of missed one of the rules in the first half of the game. And if I had realized it sooner, I likely would have won the game because it were about 10 points on the line. Um, I think that this is a fine little game. I don't think it's one that I'm going to go out and purchase. But uh, the fact that it is at a local board game cafe means I will likely play this one again because it's super easy to teach. Um, and while, you know, super um, uh, aggressive uh, abstract style games are not usually the kind of thing that I am attracted to, the fact that this worked so well with four players, which is often Oftentimes not the case with abstract style games and the fact that it was so quick and the fact that, you know, there's just so many different things that you could do. Like somebody stomps on this plan, well, you'll go over here and stomp on somebody else's plan meant that it was just an overall enjoyable experience. And yeah, like I said, I'm looking forward to trying this one more. At this point, we have reached the third game, which is Corinth. Now, this is the newest game from Days of Wonder, who is the publisher for it. And this is yet another roll and write style game. There are just a ton of these coming out right now. Uh, but for this one in particular, it is effectively Yisbahan, the roll and write game. Now, if you're not familiar with Yisbahan, this is a game that came out back in 2006 or so. And I've actually played this one a couple times. Uh, the last, uh, the only one that I have recorded was in 2011, although I definitely played this one back before I was logging my plays. And in both Yispahan and Corinth, there is a similar dice mechanism. Now, back in 2006 or so, this was a really cool idea. We've seen a lot more uh, dice drafting style mechanisms now, but the way it works in both of these games is you roll a bunch of dice, and then there is a board where you will then sort the dice that were rolled. Now, in uh, specifically Corinth, because I haven't gone back to reread the rules for Yispahan, but um, the way it works is you take all of the highest value die, and you put it onto the top of this board, and then you take all the lowest value die, and you put it to the bottom, and then you incrementally go up from the bottom. So that means if you roll like two sixes, a couple fours, a three, a two, and a one, then the sixes will be at the top, and then you have the one, two, three, and four, and then that fifth slot, well, it doesn't get filled in because you only rolled five different types of dice, not six. Now, in uh, Corinth, what you do on every single turn is uh, when you are the active player, you roll these dice and then you sort them out onto the board, and then you get to choose one of those bundles. Now, in Yisbahan, you also got to choose a bundle and then activate based off of it. That works uh, very similarly in both of these games. And in Corinth, what you then do with those dice is you choose. Will you either cross off a bunch of stuff on your board, or will you move a steward throughout the market? Now, we can start with the uh, crossing off. Um, when you look at the board, the level at which you pull the dice from is going to dictate the type of goods that you can effectively uh, trade for, and the number of dice that you pull off is going to be the number of that good that you get to trade. So that means if you pull off three fours from the spot that is, has a green background on it, then you can cross off three of the green uh, resources that are on your little player sheet. Now, on your player sheet, there are these little bundles of these different types of resources, and every time you cross off all of the, um, the things within that bundle, you then get the victory points listed on top as endgame points points. There's a little bit of a race to be the first person to do all of the uh, different types of goods within those uh, different slots. You can get like three, four, or five points for doing that. But then on top of that, you can also get points for constructing buildings. Now, you're going to construct these buildings by spending coins and goats. Now, when it comes to that board, the highest value dice is always coins, and the lowest value 
dice will always get you goats. So no matter what happens, after you roll dice, there will effectively always be coins and goats as an option. Now, you can spend these to get these buildings, which kind of subtly uh, change the uh, different um, things that you can do. Like maybe you can cross off more spices, or maybe you can gain some extra coins when you take coins and that kind of thing. Now, speaking of coins, whenever you are the active player, you can spend coins to roll some extra little golden dice, and those only help you out. So you can kind of invest in order to roll some more dice to try and have some bigger turns, but then you remove them before other people go, because after you choose, then everybody else around the table gets to choose another bundle until everybody has chosen. Now, when it comes to your turn, you pull these dice off, and again, I said you can cross off some spices if you want, or you could uh, move the steward around the market. Now, this is in the top right corner of your little uh, piece of paper that you're drawing on, and this is effectively a game of snake. So you have this little grid with the steward in the middle, and when you cho choose to move the steward, you will move the steward a number of spaces exactly equal to the number of pips of the type of dice that you took. So if you took three fours, then those are four value dice, which means you have to move the steward four times. Uh, you don't move them based off of the number of dice at all, or even the color on the board, you just look to the number of the style of dice there. Now, this is exact. You have to go exactly four spaces in that instance, and you can never cross over where you've been before, and wherever you land, you then circle that spot, and you get a various bonus. Now, what you can do is kind of circle your way all the way around this little grid here, and in the corners, you can actually, uh, if you land in those spots, you can cash out a bunch of points based off of the number of times you've actually used the steward. So, you essentially invest in this action. Like, if you do a few steward actions, then you become more motivated to do more steward actions because, well, you've invested time into it, so you may as well squeeze some more points out of those actions. Now, um, when you play a three-player game, which is what we did, you're going to take overall 18 turns. You will be the active player six times, and then, obviously, you pass this around the table, so the other two times, other people will be the active players. Now, in the game that we played, I've only played it once, um, I went pretty hard on the steward. I ended up winning the game by one point, and I had a monstrous steward score. I ended up going around the entire little area, but I crossed off a lot less of of the resources because I took so many of my turns to actually move the steward instead of crossing things off. I still got a bunch of points for those, but I remember I was very, very close to being able to construct the building that gives me a lot of points for building buildings, and I had the rest of the buildings built, so um, that would have been 12 extra points there, but I had to weigh that to the cost of not moving the steward more to cash out the investment of all the previous steward moves that I did. Now, overall, this game probably took about 20 minutes. It was very breezy. You roll the dice, then it's usually relatively simple to figure out which one of the uh, bundles you want to take. I'm not saying it's obvious which bundle you should take. There were definitely some moments where there was a decision to make, where I'm like, these are both pretty good, but then what do I not want my opponents to have? And I did a little bit of hate drafting in this game. Uh, the person who I beat by one point, um, they were just after me in turn order, and there were a couple times where I specifically took dice away to stop them from having a better overall turn. So um, at the end of the game, we um, we all kind of counted up our scores, and our scores were, were overall really quite close, and I think we all liked it. It was nice and breezy, and honestly, it did not feel like uh, many of the older, other roll-and-write style games. Obviously, you're rolling dice, and you're writing down onto a pad, but um, part of me felt like, you know, this could have just been a board game. Like, it, you, instead of crossing off tokens on your board, you could have just taken tokens from a supply. Uh, instead of, you know, doing the snake game, drawing around with a steward, you could potentially have had a board where you drop cubes down or something like that. So while this is definitely a roll and write style game, it was more of a board gamey feeling style of roll and write game, and it was still a really quick play. I mean, it was it was definitely under 30 minutes, maybe about 20 minutes. And at this point, I've only played it once, but I'm looking forward to playing it again. It's it's uh, very simple, easy to teach, um, uh, was breezy to play, and enjoyable to play the whole way through. Um, it didn't necessarily blow my socks off, but I really did enjoy it, and I always love that dice selection mechanism that's in Corinth as well as Yuzbahan, and it does kind of make me feel like Man, if I have an opportunity to play Yuzbahan again, I should really look into that. I don't know anybody who has a copy of it anymore, but either way, I uh, really quite enjoyed Corinth, and I'm planning on playing it more. All right, we've now reached game number four, and this one is D. Tavernen im Tiefenthal. Now, the direct English translation to that, I believe, is The Taverns of the Deep Valley, and when this comes out in English later on in this year, I'm not sure what the exact translation will be. It might be just Taverns of Tiefenthal, but either way, the reason I was interested in this game when I first heard about it back in about January of this year was because this is the newest game designed by Wolfgang Barsch. Now, he has designed several interesting games over the last couple of years. He's really kind of exploded onto the scene. Um, he has 
has the uh, Gonshin Clever, Doppelit So Clever. Uh, there is also the Mind and the Quacks of Quedlinburg and Bricks. And uh, he's just really put out a lot of interesting stuff overall. Some of those games I like more than others, but in each one of those games, there's been some pretty cool nuggets of design ideas. Now, in terms of this game right here, you are effectively running a tavern and everybody is running their own tavern. This is a competitive game. And what you're trying to do throughout this game is you want to um, build out your tavern and upgrade it, but you also want to cultivate the regulars that you have who actually come into your tavern, hopefully every single night or as often as possible to give you money that you can then use to upgrade your overall tavern. Now, mechanically, the way this works is the tavern you have in front of you is a ton of different cardboard pieces that kind of puzzle in together to make up your overall tavern. Now, on your turn, what you do at the the, you know, about the start of your turn is you are going to deal cards out from the top of your deck and this effectively shows your tavern filling up. In fact, the rules that I was reading, there's an, uh, a non-official English translation out on BGG said that this is the tavern fills up phase and you keep drawing cards from your deck until all of the tables in your tavern are filled. Now, at the start of the game, you only have three of these tables, but within that deck, you might also have more tables in there. Like You can add that table down onto your board and then keep drawing until you fill that table up as well. So the number of cards that you draw each turn is going to vary based off of how quickly you fill out all of these tables. Now, once you do that, there is then a dice rolling and drafting phase. Every person is going to roll these four dice and then put them onto a coaster, and and then in turn order, everyone's going to draft one die from that coaster, and then you will pass all of the coasters clockwise, and then in turn order again, you draft another die from that coaster. So it's these kind of little um, mini little pools of dice that get drafted from, and then once you do that, you can plan with the dice, and you'll put these dice down onto various different spots on your tavern. Now there are some uh, built-in places in your tavern where you could just put like any die onto the cash register to get a money, or any die down into the beer kegs to get some extra beer, but the guests that come in also have die places on them. In fact, you might draw a bunch of guests, but then not be able to draft the dice that actually activate them, in which case you get no benefit for having them come by. I guess they kind of came in and you forgot to serve them. And um, when it comes to these guests, if the guest wants a two value die, then they will give you two money. If they have a five, they want a five value die, then they will give you five money. So there's a direct correlation right there. And what you then do is you just associate your dice around there. It's essentially action point uh, um, allowance kind of thing going on. You just want to put these out into the right orientation. And then you will evaluate the dice and you might get a bunch of money. You might also get a bunch of beer and you spend your money in order to upgrade your wait staff. That might be new cards that you put into your deck. Those could be new waitresses. It could be a bard who entertains people. It could be another beer uh, merchant so that you can get more beer into your overall supply. And you can also spend your money to flip over all of these puzzle pieces in your tavern. Now, as you do that, you essentially permanently upgrade your overall tavern. You might now have a permanent waitress every single round, whether or not you draw one from your deck. You might also be able to flip something over so you can store a bunch more beer than you could have before because maybe you aren't able to spend it all. Now, when it comes to beer, what you do with this is you are trying to get new guests. So you spend beer in order to get new regulars into your deck. And at the start of the game, your regulars that you have in there only evaluate on value one and two dice, which means they give you one or two gold each. But you might be able to spend like six or eight beer on a turn if you were able to make it in order to pick up a new um, uh, regular to put into your deck, and this person might um, only want sixes. And if you put a six on them, you get six money, which is a ton of money that you can use to upgrade your tavern a bunch and do all those various things. Now, every time you flip over a token on your tavern, you gain a noble and they are worth 10 points each, which is a ton of points considering that eight beer person you just got was maybe worth just like three or four points. Now, what you are effectively doing throughout this entire game as you go through um, eight overall rounds is you're just trying to get points into that deck. Um, every card in your deck at the end of the game is going to be worth points to you. Well, some of them aren't worth points, but you add up all of the points in your deck and that is your final score. So this game is all about cultivating that deck while also upgrading your tavern. But every time you upgrade the tavern, you get a new noble, which is worth 10 points, which is important. Now, the catch for the nobles is they only activate on twos, which only give you two money. So when you um, deal out a bunch of nobles, that's kind of a rough turn because you're like, well, yay, I have a bunch of points for the end of the game, but two money, two money, two money, and then maybe you only draft one or two of the twos, then you can't even get that much money from them. So you can have much more powerful turns with the non-nobles, but you kind of need nobles to win. 
Now, uh, there are ways to subtly change the dice. You can get dishwashers, which allow you to add pips to the dice. And um, the last thing I want to say before I talk about my play of this game, I've talked about it a lot already, is the fact that this game comes with five overall modules. Now, these integrate more complexity to the game as you play. And the rule said, if you're inexperienced with games, then start with no modules. And if you're experienced with games, then maybe start with the first three modules. And that's what I did. Um, now, these integrated um, some extra mechanics with some performers that you can bring in. It has a new uh, resource called Schnapps that you could spend to feed the performers to like breathe fire on guests and all that kind of stuff, which you do actually kind of want to do, causes them to run away and leave your deck, which you might not want for some of those lower value people. But um, you also have some reputation that you can get. And I, I need to stop talking about the mechanics of this and talk about my impressions of it now because, um, well, first of all, I enjoyed it. But I mean, obviously I've talked about this a bunch already and there's just a lot going on but every one of those things is pretty simple. You know, the act of dealing out your deck is simple. The act of drafting the dice is simple. The act of actually choosing where you put your dice is not quite as simple, but it just seems like this is a game with a ton of mechanics kind of jumbled all around together. And in this first play, there were the three of us playing, and I think all of us really enjoyed it. Um, I, it didn't necessarily blow me away, but I was really intrigued by how it played, and I am quite interested to try this more. I played with only the first three modules, and so I'm very interested to try the fourth and fifth modules. Uh, they bring in some asymmetry between the players, as well as a guest book that you can have the people as they come in uh, to your deck. They can kind of put these little tokens down onto your guest book to get even more little bonuses, because this is a game where you just get stuff for doing all sorts of stuff. And um, I don't know, it's just kind of a fun experience to balance all of that. Now, um, in terms of the individual mechanics themselves, the deck building is pretty simple. Um, the different types of cards that you put in there are very straightforward. You know, if you put a card in there that activates on a two, it gets you two money. If you put a card in there that activates on a four, it gets you four money. That's pretty much the extent of the diversity of these cards. Some of them give you uh, one-shot bonuses when you um, first get them, but whenever you play them out, it's very overall straightforward. But this game does allow you to kind of build up towards some really big turns. Now, there is a luck aspect to this game. I mean, in our play, we were in the eighth round of the game, and uh, Jessica was playing, and she had this great deck. She had tons of uh, people in there. She had tons of tables. If you draw more tables, you can draw more people. And she drew it out, and it was an awful like layout. She just did not pull that much stuff out. Now, there are a couple tokens you can spend to redo your overall tavern filling in phase. You essentially kick everybody out and fill it in again. And she ended up doing that twice and never really got to a big turn, even though she could have in her deck. It was just kind of some rough luck there. Whereas me, uh, with my first deal out in that last round of the game, I got like three or four of these tables and I got some really great uh, people uh, lodged into all of these. So I got tons of money and I was able to upgrade my tavern a couple different times, which gave me a bunch of different nobles. And that is what ended up putting me into the winning position. I think I won by a lot. Uh, I had like, like 106 points and then um, my two opponents had like around the 70s or 80s or something or something like that. Now, obviously one noble is worth 10 points. So winning by, you know, 20 points is just two different cards. And there are lots of different ways that our opponent, my opponents were very close to getting some more of these, but in the end, um, I am intrigued to try this one more. I want to experiment with more of the modules. I um, am looking forward to seeing more of those big combo-tastic turns and um, also trying to maybe specialize on certain things as you go throughout the game. I think all of us played relatively poorly, if I'm being honest. Like, we did not really focus on flipping over and upgrading our taverns as much as we maybe could have. And I think on the next play, I will certainly be much more smart about a lot of the decisions that I make. But um, I guess this is a game that you have to go into knowing that there's going to be luck. Um, I definitely definitely got some Quacks of Quedlinburg uh, vibes from this game. Uh, that's a game that came out last year from the same designer where you were deck building with tokens in a bag and you pushed your luck by pulling them out. And it might be the last round of the game and you could just have an awful pull from that bag. And a, same, a similar thing can happen here uh, with an awful uh, pull from your deck. But it is nice that um, uh, this game right here has the ability to spend certain tokens in order to redraw so that hopefully if you have a really awful turn, you can effectively redo that overall turn. So um, yeah, I I'm interested in trying this one more. Um, I'm maybe not quite as crazy excited about it now that I've played it once. I was super intrigued to try this one. I bought it two months ago and I got stuck in customs for like seven weeks. And now that I finally played it, I am happy to have played it, but I feel like maybe I had set my expectations a little bit too high. Part of that might be because it took seven freaking weeks for this game to show up as it got stuck in customs. So uh, my interest to try it got more and more and more. Uh, but at this point, I do want to play it more. I just don't think it's necessarily going to be, you know, my favorite game of the year or anything like that. 
Alrighty, let's now move on to game number five, and this one is Kokoro. Now, I was able to play this one a few weeks ago, and this is effectively a retheming of a game that came out a couple years ago called Avenue. Now, there are some very subtle differences between these two games, but I effectively played Avenue as, when I played Kokoro, because when I look at the differences, they are very, very close. Now, in Avenue, you had a pad of paper that you drew on with a pencil, and in Kokoro, you have these boards that you draw on with dry erase pe uh, pens. This is one of the main ways that there is a difference between these two overall games. Um, I guess if I had Avenue, I would probably end up laminating it anyway. Now, mechanically, what the way it works for both of these games is each player is going to be uh, simultaneously drawing little angles onto their board. Now, you're going to flip over a card from the middle of the table, and then everybody is going to draw that shape anywhere on their board. Um, they don't have to be connected to previous things or anything like that. Now, there are two different colored cards. There are regular cards and yellow cards, and once you hit a certain number of the yellow cards, that will will end the round and then everybody will score. Now in the round there is going to be a letter card that's face up and that is associated with one of the little houses on the board that you have in front of you. Now, when you score, you are just going to um, go out from all of the um, avenues, little roads that are connecting that specific hut up to uh, various icons on the board, and you count up the various icons and you get points for it. So you are trying to increase your road length based off of the type of uh, the the position of the hut that is scoring in that round. And then once you finish the scoring, you flip over a new one of those huts, and then you will score from that one in the next round once you uh, continue to go through and hit a certain number of those yellow cards. Now, obviously, you are trying to connect your roads up so that as you go through, you can have things that scored before score again. You know, if I score over here for a C and then the A scores, if I'm able to connect that road up to here, then I'll get points for all of those previous ones that I already put in there. And that is important because as you go through the game and you score, you actually lose points if you ever score less points in a round than you did in the previous round. So you are somewhat motivated to try and start off kind of small and build up to bigger and bigger points. But if you have an opportunity to go really big on like the second or third scoring, well, that's great as long as you can back that up with even more greater scorings after that. Otherwise, like I said, you might end up losing some points. Now, that is the majority of the game. There are a couple other icons on the board that will score based off of the different types of um, uh, icons that they're touching at the end of the game. And it's worth noting that in Kokoro, there is a new mechanic where you flip over a card that gives a special rule to that game versus an avenue. It did not have that. Um, in the play of Kokoro that I did, um, that effectively let us... Um, choose one card as if it was wild one time in the game. So one time when a card was flipped, like, I don't like that. I'm going to put something else down. And so it was a very uh, subtle tweak to the game that made it just slightly easier. Now, overall, I really enjoyed it. I mean, we played like six players, I think, maybe more, maybe seven players. Uh, we were at uh, Victory Point Cafe, and we were in a moment where we didn't have that much time left. The, the store was about to close, so we got this one out. Um, it was taught to me and a bunch of other people, and we played through it. The overall game took certainly less than 30 minutes. Maybe it was more like 25 or 20 minutes. And I, I really enjoyed it. The decisions I made um, really felt impactful. Uh, one thing I like to see in roll and write style games, especially with little route building, is with, um, having me be upset with the decisions I made earlier. And that certainly happened here where I'm just like, why did I put that over there? And well, of course, at that moment, I thought I'd do this thing over here or there. But as the game evolved, I found myself getting into the position where I was having a really tough time connecting some of the later huts to the huge um, a road that I had essentially built out. Um, and that's, you know, effectively the game. You want to try and build this up as it goes up and up. And I could certainly see myself playing this one some more. Um, it was uh, very enjoyable, very quick, uh, lots of good decisions. Simultaneous play for a ton of different people meant that it was pretty breezy for that player count. I do think now that I think about it a little bit more, it was probably closer to 30 minutes uh, when it was all said and done, but it did not feel like it overstayed its welcome as we were working our way through it. I don't even remember if I won, but I do think I did relatively well, and I certainly felt like my decisions mattered, and like I said, uh, there were many times where I was kicking myself for the previous decisions that I made, which I do like to see in this style of game. So um, I'm probably not going to go out and get a copy of this one, but I certainly could see myself playing this one again in the future when I'm at victory point. At this point, we have reached the sixth and final game I'll be talking about, and that one is Space Base, but specifically with the Shy Pluto expansion. Now, it's important to note that there are going to be a little bit of uh, spoilers that I'll be talking about here. I'm not going to put any photos up of spoilers, and the reason for that is because this is a very interesting style of expansion. Now, I'm going to talk without spoilers for a bit, and then I'll mention when I start to get into the spoiler territory, because if you have played Space Base and you enjoy Space Base and you're interested in Shy Pluto, then I want you to learn a little bit about it without being spoiled. 
spoiled. Now, the reason for that is because I've really enjoyed this expansion overall so far, and in general, I'm not crazy about expansions. Now, the way this expansion works is it is essentially a narrative expansion, where it's a small box, and when you open it up, there's going to be a deck of cards that gives you a, um, a threshold uh, or a condition that you have to meet uh, collectively within a play in order to move on to the next step. Now, I'm not going to talk about what any of those are just yet, um, but what that means is when you first start playing this game, it's effectively the same game as a regular game of Space Base. There's a tiny uh, tweak to uh, make players be a little bit different, but you're effectively playing Space Base. Now, as you play through that first game, you will likely get to the point where you hit that first, first threshold, and then you stop the game, you read the card, you flip it over, and then you um, pull out some new cards and maybe some new mechanics, and suddenly, in the middle of that play, the game is different, and suddenly the goals are slightly different uh, within that one specific play. And this is something that we saw with some of the Pandemic Legacies, as well as Risk Legacy in particular. Um, that game had a lot of conditions to bring out new uh, overall content, and it was re it's really cool to see um, Space Base come in with an expansion that's built around that idea. Now, the reason that, in general, I'm not crazy about expansions is because, well, oftentimes when I want to sit down and play a game with an expansion, I have to kind of relearn the rules to that expansion, and many times, instead of, you know, teaching the base game and the expansion, I'll just play something else. But what happens here with the Shy Pluto expansion is because the fact that the content comes out in this kind of drip feed way, I have been really motivated to play this game. Um, I have played Space Base, I think, three or four times over the course of this month, and I had not played Space Base in, like, I don't know, eight months to a year before that. Uh, the fact that this game got so much sudden play is really entirely due to the fact that this expansion exists because I played it that first time and we brought out some new stuff and I thought that was pretty cool. So next week I was like, can we play Space Base again? I want to see what else is going to come out of this box. Now at this point, like I said, I've played, I, I can't remember if it's three or four times and I've gone through about two-thirds to three-quarters of the content. And again, from a non-spoilery perspective, I just want to say that I think this is an awesome way to inject new content into a game and to inject new enthusiasm into playing that game over and over again to see what is new. Now, at this point, I'm going to start to verge a little bit into spoiler territory because um, I can say here that, you know, I have not finished this out yet. Uh, part of me thought about waiting on to uh, give you my impressions until I'd finished it, but um, it might be a little bit longer. I did play this game a lot this last month, and even though I'm quite interested to see what's uh, what else is in the box. Um, I think that after playing it that many times, I'll maybe give it a month break before I jump into it again and see more. Now, as I said, I've played it, you know, three or four times, and we've seen over half of the new content, which I think is totally fine. I mean, that's a lot of plays anyway. I think a lot of board games, if they get played four times ever, then that's going to be success. So obviously an expansion motivating you to play it maybe five or even six times, maybe seven, I don't know, in order to completely finish out the expansion is a uh, certainly a good sign. Now, um, I do want to talk about uh, some of the mechanics that I have seen so far, so I am going to verge right into spoiler territory here. Um, now, as you go through this expansion, uh, you will unlock new things, and they get shuffled right into those decks of cards, so that in future games you have new content, and there are some pretty cool new abilities on the ships. Um, there's uh, some ships where you can essentially do a bonus roll with some special new, um, well, they're standard D6s, but they're clear D6s, and you get your own special extra turn, effectively, and then there are these bonkers ships that come out a couple of modules in that enable some crazy combinations. Now, um, if you're familiar with Space Base, you will know that um, you can only activate blue things, blue abilities on your turn, and red abilities when it's not your turn. And this ship, when you evaluate the blue thing, it actually activates the red things for both of the adjacent ships. And when you flip this up, then the red thing for it activates one of the adjacent blue things. I think it's one or the other, it's not both. But what that means is on other players' turns, you can activate your blue abilities, and this can set up some ridiculous combos. And in one or two of the games with these ships, um, they have um, been a huge factor in how the game uh, went. Not certain, they weren't necessarily um, overpowered because you do have to they're crazy powerful if you build to them. They can be total duds if you don't build them out well, but uh, I like the fact that they have that potential to be so combo-tastic in order to kind of rush out the end of the game. Now, the other thing I want to mention from a hugely spoilery perspective is we got to a point in the middle of this expansion where we suddenly had effectively an enemy that we had to fight, and there is this wonderful mechanic in it where the there are these new dice that come in. I think there's six of them. They're small red dice, and five of those sides are blank, and one side has an icon on it. That icon might be three or four money, it might be a victory point, it might be an income. 
And what happens is that at certain points, I'm not going to go into all of the spoilery details, but at certain points, those dice will be rolled. Now, five out of those six faces on those dice are blank, which means there's a pretty decent uh, shot that if you roll all six of these, that no uh, icons will show up. And that did happen a few times in the game that we played. But there are a couple times where maybe three money shows up and a victory point and an income. And at that moment, players can spend a new resource in order to gain all of that stuff. Now, this is a big way to inject more points and more money and more income into the overall game. However, if a player is unable to spend that resource to gain those things, they lose all of those things. So this is this kind of crazy um, uh, you know, whiplash type of thing going on here where you want to try and have this new resource in order to try and get the benefits when they show up. And when you find yourself out of that resource and you just cannot activate that ship to give you more of that resource, um, it gets really stressful when those dice get rolled because you're just like, oh, I, I can't do anything. Please be all blanks. Please be all blanks. And you don't want to see, you know, uh, most of your money get wiped out. Um, so I've really enjoyed that mechanic and I'm hoping to see that one um, go more throughout the game. Again, that's kind of the last module that I've unlocked and there's still a decent number of uh, cards that can get added into the game. So there's a lot more content that I uh, have yet to see and I'm I'm really enjoying the new stuff that this brings into Space Base. The, um, the way the narrative arc goes is not the most engaging thing in the world, but um, I don't know. I, I think it's been a really solid, highly successful expansion to see the game get played so many more times to bring in so much new, fresh mechanical ideas to this game that I did already like, but it had been sitting on my shelf for a long time, and I kept thinking, I'll get back around to playing Space Base someday, and now I have this expansion which says, get back around to playing Space Base right now. There's new stuff. Every time you play, I'm going to show you something new, until, of course, maybe you get to the sixth or seventh play when you run out, and it's entirely possible they might keep doing this. I know that AEG, who's the publisher, is planning on using this style of content injection in more of their future games. Um, so, yeah, I think it's just a really good sign of what's coming, and I think as far as an expansion is concerned, it is definitely a success as far as uh, getting me to play that expansion. All right, that is going to bring us to the end of this impressions vlog. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, it's certainly been a uh, interesting month overall, like super heavy, crazy, complex games, and then quite a few uh, rather lighter games. And it was great that I enjoyed all of the games that I played. All of the new games that I played this month were successes for me. Um, that does not always happen, although I, of course, try to curate the games that I actively try to play to be ones that I will enjoy. But that isn't always the case. But yeah, May was a really good game, a uh, really good month for new board games for me, and I think that's going to bring us to the end. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including all of these producer-level Patreon backers. If you too would like to directly support the channel and the creation of videos like this one, then please go to johngetsgames.com support to see a variety of ways with which you could do that. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please click the like button down below as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.